non Mendelian genetics. It's pretty interesting, I think. Um, basically, the whole concept behind non Mendelian genetics is that there are some exceptions to Mendelian genetics. So non Mendelian genetics is everything that doesn't fall under the you know, normal Mendelian genetics. We talked about Mendelian genetics. Um, we've talked about it quite a bit, I suppose. It all is based on this one dude's findings, for the most part. Um, Gregor Mendel, yes, he named this topic after himself. As most scientists do, they generally name discoveries after themselves. Uh, and uh, he, he, he did the same. This is Mendel. So he came up with some principles that we had reviewed last class. Let's see if I can remember them all this time. Law of dominance, which states that, excuse me, that you've got dominant and recessive traits. Dominant will always win out over recessive. Um, law of inheritance, which states that everything like your genes are inherited from your parents essentially and then the law of independent assortment which is basically saying that everything is a chance so when you're forming your sex cells you don't really know which sex cell is going to which egg is going to be released and what that what dna is specifically in that egg um, and how that all occurs and what are the chances, you know? How, what are the chances that this sperm is going to reach that egg? Uh, that type of uh, scenario. And there's a fourth one. I know it's going to come to me as soon as I start talking about non Mendelian genetics, but. Oh, um, gosh, I don't remember the name of it, but it states that you only get one, uh, one set of genes from each parent. So again, non-Mendelian genetics are all the exceptions to those four principles. And I want to clarify, when I say principles, laws, rules, um, I don't mean a law as in, oh, if you break the law, then you're going to be punished. Like Mendel just came up with the rules that you have to follow. No, Mendel's principles are based on observations of the real world. So based on all of his experiments that he did and observations he made that just you know, occur naturally in nature. I remember his experiments were based on peas and uh, flies. He did experiments on peas and flies. And those experiments yielded data. And the data basically led to, you know, the principles that he came up with. So based on those observations and experiments, he says, well, this happens in most cases. Now, in some cases, these exceptions occur. And these exceptions include uh, the fact that not all genes show simple patterns of dominant versus recessive alleles. Remember when we talked about dominance versus recession, dominance versus recessiveness? <laughs> dominance was generally associated with a capital letter, um, and then recessive was associated with lowercase letters. Anytime we had two capitals, it was automatically dominant. Anytime we had a capital and a lowercase together, that heterozygous combination, still going to go to the dominant trait. Um, that's physically what we're going to see. That's the phenotype is going to be the dominant trait. And then the only way to get the recessive trait was if you had two lowercase letters. Okay. Um, then we have the majority of genes have more than two alleles. Obviously, if we're talking about the gene for height or, well, that's not really a good example, um, the gene for hair color, you, ha you still have, you're still talking about that one specific gene regarding hair color, but there's a lot more than just two different types of hair colors. <laughs> you got brown, you got blonde, you got dirty blonde, you got red, like a deep, bright red, you got a dark red, You've got strawberry blonde. There's a bunch of different, com oh, black. How can I forget black? Um, a bunch of different combinations uh, from various alleles that you can see. All about, all talking about that one gene, hair color, um, but different 
alleles involved. Then you have many traits that can be controlled by more than one gene. So at this point you have traits like eye color that can actually be controlled by more than one gene. So let's draw out an example. Here's a chromosome. Here's another chromosome. Remember we have 23 chromosomes in all of our, in each of our sex cells, 46 in our body cells. Let's say that just out of these three chromosomes that I drew, we've got a gene here and another gene there. I'm just going to pick random colors and they're just going to indicate that there's a different gene there. All right, beautiful. That's one chromosome We've made up of a bunch of different genes. And let's say that this uh, green gene here codes for eye color. Well, there can be more uh, cases where things like eye color um, are controlled. Certain traits are controlled by more than one gene. Sometimes those genes are on the same chromosome. So let's say these two green genes code for eye color. Other times, uh, these genes are on different chromosomes. They code for the same trait, but there's more than one gene involved in, um, in the results. So, yeah. Pretty interesting how our body works. Examples of, how, of the exceptions to the law of dominance uh, could include incomplete dominance, Incomplete dominance is when one allele is not dominant over the other. And what we actually see is a third phenotype being expressed. So we have multiple combinations that we can come up with as far as what we've got here. We're using the letters uh, A. We see two capital A's and that codes for a red flower. Then we've got two lowercase a's that codes for a white flower. These, this is the parent generation. That's why we have the P here in line with these two flowers. I know it's kind of hard to see now that I've drawn kind of over the image, but they have one offspring, the pink guy down here. And the pink flower is represented by a capital A, lowercase a. So that heterozygous combination Traditionally, if we would have put these parents into a um, into a Punnett square, it would have looked something like this. It's two capital A's, two lowercase a's, and every offspring would be heterozygous. That heterozygous trait, do you guys know what color it would code for? It'd be the dominant color. What color is the dominant color in this example? Very good, Ariel, red. Yes, Juanita, red. Uh, we know that because there's two capital A's there. We know that's gotta be the dominant trait, but this is the exception to that law of dominance rule, right? Um, so what we see here as opposed to what we would have guessed originally is that none of these actually come out red. They're all going to come out pink. Uh, our heterozygous trait codes for a completely different phenotype and that phenotype is pink, which is why we see a pink flower down here. Now let's erase this Punnett square and redraw it with what we know now. We know that the offspring comes out pink. And what happens if this offspring were to, I don't want to say mate because they're flowers. It's not like they're mating per se, but what happens if this flower is then um, fertilized with another pink flower? Well, we've got a capital A and a lowercase a. And then we've got another capital A, lowercase a. 
Let's see what the possible offspring might look like. All right. With this, um, we've got two capital A's up at the top left corner. What is that going to code for? What color will that code for? What colored flower? Red, exactly. So we have one red offspring. What about these two heterozygous? <laughs> Harriel already had it ready. We have two pink flowers, exactly. And then last but not least, we are left with two um, homozygous recessive, exactly, white. So we have one white flower. Okay, that is a potential offspring for F2. And we see that here in this second generation um, that was so graciously drawn for us. But that's, uh, those are the possible offspring that we would see given the Punnett square if we were to cross two heterozygous uh, flowers in this example. Yep, so this is where we see a third phenotype. It's kind of like a mixture, right? We see, uh, imagine mixing red paint and white paint. It kind of gives you a pink. Um, so you don't see, like, neither gene is fully expressed, sorry, neither trait is fully expressed, but kind of a mixture of both. Um, the next type of dominance we'll talk about is co-dominance. So as opposed to a mixture of the two colors, here we actually see both alleles being expressed at the same time. So we're still talking about uh, color. We're, in this instance, we're talking about the color of the cow's coat. Uh, and we have a white flower, a white, white cow, excuse me, a white cow uh, being crossed with a, a brown, it's kind of got a red hue, but a brown cow. And when we look at the offspring produced, we see a cow that has white and brown, right? If this was incomplete dominance, we kind of see like a lighter brown, right? Across the entire cow. The whole cow would just be like a really light brown. Think about it if you have like coffee or hot chocolate, if you put white milk in it, it starts to, to make that brown seem a little lighter. Uh, that would be incomplete dominance, but with co-dominance, we see both alleles, both the brown and white, not a mixture of the two per se. Yeah. And also co-dominance, uh, the co portion means, excuse me, both. You, if you hear co-ed, it usually means both boys and girls. If you hear co pilot, you're saying, well, they're both the pilot. They work together. Um, Co-captain, you have two captains. They're both the captain. Next thing we have is multiple alleles. I find this a bit more difficult to explain. Um, you kind of have to look at the graphs to understand it better, but we have multiple different blood types. And if we look at the genotype, we might get a little confused. But there are more alleles. There's more than two possible alleles that exist. It's not an either or situation. You can express both at the same time. I'll look at A and B, for example. Um, and it also depends on the type of antigens. Uh, that are on. So it basically depends on the structure of the blood cell that you have, as well as the blood type, um, as far as what type of blood that you can receive. So that's, that's why and how it differs when you look at that column for the type of blood you can receive. This is a bit complicated and it's kind of hard to explain um, in great detail unless you have studied blood type or if unless we had time to actually talk about it in more detail. Uh, so we won't spend too much time on it. Just know that there are certain genes that have multiple alleles 
uh, that could affect um, the genotype that you express. Next topic, polygenic traits. Polygenic traits are traits that are controlled by several genes, often on multiple chromosomes. Remember I drew out the chromosomes and showed you how the genes can be on two different. One of those examples is skin color and one is eye color. Here we have a picture of eye color. Uh, so I think this is one reason that we can see various shades of like the color blue um, in our eyes, for example as well as green. Oh, and hazel for sure, my goodness, because hazel you have those like green eyes and then on the inside they they kind of uh, have a brown hue to them as well. So it kind of looks like a tiger eye. Uh, it's just, it's really pretty. My husband's got hazel eyes. <laughs> then you can have even different shades of brown. You can have that really dark piercing brown that almost looks black and then you can have the really milky chocolate um, looking eye. It's kind of a lighter brown. Uh, there's tons of different shades and I, I want to say that the fact that we have multiple genes controlling that one uh, trait could be or is most likely why you can see so many different shades of uh, the eye color itself. Skin color. Skin color, I feel like a lot of people might be afraid to talk about, but I think it's just so fascinating how our bodies have evolved and, and changed in so many ways. Uh, at this point, we have, according to this image, three genes that code for skin color. Three genes. Lots of factors there. And this chart just shows a number of shades that we can range from and obviously there's more than this because especially as ladies know that trying to find foundation that matches your skin tone um, your skin color is just so difficult nowadays <laughs> or I mean I just has always been difficult um, but why is it that some people have one eye color and the other of one what other have Juan, uh, Juanita is asking a question about um, eye color. Let's go back to that real quick. She's asking why some people have one eye color in one eye and then a different eye color in the other. And I almost want to, I, I want to say that that has to do with the fact that many or multiple genes are involved here. So polygenic traits, I suppose, I think I forgot to explain. Poly means many. And then genic mean is or genic is referring to genes. So these are the traits that are expressed by are controlled, excuse me, controlled by several genes. And if you have more than one gene expressing or controlling this trait, maybe one of those genes codes for like blue and the other uh, codes for green, then that could be why. Ariel says it's called heterochromia. I did not know that. Uh, a lot of, I haven't really seen, well, there, there's one actor that I've seen on uh, Shadowhunters, the, the, the blonde guy, he's got blue and green. Um, but I think cats, <laughs> cats have different colored eyes. I feel, I, see, I feel like I see it a lot. So their gene for eye color was different for each one. Yeah, that's what I would think um, would be the case here. Apparently green and blue are just the, the common. Oh, look at how cute. Kitties. Oh, yeah. In color. Next week, we're going to start talking about evolution and adaptations, which are changes in our DNA, uh, which arise from mutations, but they're like positive mutations. 
Um, well, in some cases, <laughs> sometimes they're negative. Um, but one of the changes that we can see over time is actually skin color. If we go way back when to when everyone was, uh, all of our ancestors were in Africa, because that's where we originated from. And um, most everyone had darker skin and it was because they lived close to the equator where they were very exposed to the sun. There was a lot of sun <laughs> that shines around the equator. And it was uh, a good thing to have dark skin um, because when you have dark skin, you're producing more melanin and the mel melanin helps to block some of those rays that you get from the sun, which if you're in a very sunny area, that's, that's a very positive thing. It's very helpful to keep you from getting, um, you know, all that solar radiation. But as people started to migrate, um, at a, there were mutations and some children came out a little lighter and it wasn't as big of a problem because they were moving away from the equator and they actually it, it ended up being a positive adaptation because they needed a little more sun uh, as they moved away from the equator they didn't need as much protection from the sun and they actually needed to absorb more of the vitamin d from the sun uh, so this ended up being a positive adaptation the farther you get away from the equator you'll see some uh, cultures that are not even cultures, but some groups of people, like people in Sweden and Norway and Finland, where it's very cloudy and it's not as sunny and it's very far from the equator. They ha tend to have a group of people that are very, very light in skin tone. Like those people, I mean, gorgeous, right? But, but very pale. And it's because they don't need protection from the sun. So their body's not producing that high amount of melanin um, which is why they appear very pale. And then they also need to absorb some of that sunlight because they're still needing to um, absorb more vitamin D because they're not exposed to much of it up in that area. So it just ended up being a positive adaptation as folks moved farther from the equator. Nowadays, I mean, you can go anywhere and live anywhere you want. and you know, it doesn't really, it's not, I don't, I don't personally see it affecting evolution as much nowadays, but way back when, um, our bodies just evolved depending on um, our genes, like mutations and stuff, and then where we lived and uh, what helped us survive the best in that area. And so that's how we ended up with a bunch of different skin, uh, skin tones. Yeah, you'll probably hear the story again because <laughs> as we continue talking about evolution adaptations, I just think it's so fascinating. Uh, but yeah, here we, it's still a polygenic trait. We have three genes that are involved in um, the factor of, you know, what shade of um, color our skin is, so, yep. Now here is my favorite thing to talk about is sex link traits. There are some traits that are linked to the specific chromosomes, uh, sex chromosomes that you have. And I wanna just uh, start off by saying, ladies, you are some lucky ducks, okay? Us ladies, remember we have two X chromosomes. X, X. We have two X chromosomes. Men, you are identified by an X and a Y. This is your sex chrom. This is the, the pair of chromosomes that determine your gender. They're the 23rd pair of chromosomes in your cell cells. Guys, you have X and a Y. Ladies, you have two X's. The reason I say that us ladies are just awesome, so lucky because we have two X chromosomes, is that with sex link traits, we generally see one of the genes on our X chromosomes. There's a mutation or something has happened uh, to a specific trait that can, um, you know, be found on one of our X chromosomes. Because we have two X chromosomes, 
even if there's a, a messed up, like a wonky gene on one of them, we still have a second chromosome to rely on, a second X chromosome to rely on. So that funky trait is not necessarily expressed for us because we have the second X chromosome to rely on. But guys, you only have one X chromosome to rely on. So if you inherit an X chromosome with like a funky trait on it, then you will express that trait. Um, so what we see here is we have, um, when a woman has one of those funky X chromosomes, she's called a carrier because she still has the potential to pass that X chromosome with the bad trait on it to one of her kids. Uh, or to her children, not necessarily just one of them. In this example that we see, uh, we have a mother and a father. The mother is a carrier for some trait. And she passes, she has, they have four children together. The first son on the far left, he is unaffected because he got mom's good X chromosome. Okay, he got the good X chromosome. And then of course he got the Y from dad. That's what makes him a male. Their second daughter, or their, their second child, I should say, their first daughter, is also unaffected because she got dad's X chromosome, just fine. And then she got mom's good X chromosome. Awesome, so she's not a carrier. She is perfectly normal. Their second daughter, third child, is a carrier because she got mom's funky X chromosome, which means that she has the potential to pass this trait on to her children. No, she will not express it. She's not affected by the trait, but she does have the potential to pass it on to the next generation. Then their youngest brother here is also affected because he unfortunately only has one X chromosome, which means he will be affected by this trait. It's always a middle child. I know, right? That are the youngest. Um, and their son will have, of course, the Y chromosome from the dad, makes him the boy, and then the wonky X chromosome from mom, which gives him that trait. An example of a sex-linked trait, guys, did you know um, that red-green color blindness, meaning you can't really see red or green, is a sex-linked trait. So I wonder if you have this trait, how do you drive? <laughs> how do you see the stoplights? You know, the red, yellow, green? Obviously, people with this trait, it's not like it's an, it's, oh, you're going to die type thing. You know, people can live with this just fine. My husband's grandfather is red, green, colorblind. As far as I know, um, it was not a trait that was necessarily passed on to his children, as far as I know, because, you know, none of, his, none of his grandchildren have the trait, at least. Um, He is red, green, colorblind, so he drives just fine, by the way. <laughs> this is something that you can get used to and you can live with just fine. Um, you, it just, it depends on the person as far as what shade of color you see. I'm not sure if it's like a shade of gray or maybe they see like, as opposed to red, you might see a shade of, you know, pink or orange or something, a little lighter green. Maybe you see almost like a shade of yellowish. I'm not sure, but it's not like it's an end all be all thing. One way that we can track these sex link traits is using what's called a pedigree. If you're not familiar with a pedigree, it's kind of similar to a family tree, um, but it's meant to kind of show some medical background <laughs> a little bit. Um, the true definition is recorded ancestry of a person or a family, especially upper class ancestry. 
As you can see, we've got an example of Queen Victoria's ancestry, or at least not necessarily her ancestry, but you know, her pedigree for her children and such. Turns out Queen Victoria was a carrier for a disease called hemophilia. If you have not heard of hemophilia, it is hemophilia. It, um, it's where your blood can't clot properly. So if you get a cut, a nosebleed, um, internal bleeding, your body can't naturally stop the bleeding uh, because it, it can't get the white blood cells to, to clot in that area, to group up and to kind of plug the area uh, to stop allowing the blood to escape. Uh, so it's kind of a problem because if you get a serious cut, then you might lose too much blood and then you could potentially die from something like that. Same thing with internal injuries. You get in a car wreck and it may even be a minor car wreck, but if you have, well, I guess it's not minor if you have internal bleeding. <laughs> but uh, even a scenario like that, it's very difficult for folks to stop the bleeding and allow their bodies to heal. So it is unfortunate. It is rare, but Queen Victoria was a carrier for this disease and she passed it on to her daughter, Alice. How do we read a pedigree before we move any further? Well, Alice here is a girl. The girls are represented by circles on pedigrees. The males are represented by squares. So you can see Alice and Louie, they are connected by a line. Um, Alice was a female, Louie was a male. I just mentioned that Alice and Louie are connected. You can see this line that connects the two. This indicates a marriage of some sort uh, or the fact that they had children together, but based on the time period, we know, you know they were married and had children. So Alice and Louie, they were married, they had children. Um, we can see the children just by following this line. This line is connected to six people. Generally, it's in birth order. So the far left will have the oldest and then you'll go from there. And the far right is going to be the youngest. So on the far right, we have a circle, which means a girl. That's kid number one. Kid number two, another girl. Kid number three, another girl. <laughs> kid number four, a boy. Kid number five, another girl. And kid number six, another girl. Does anybody know why I did not include Henry or Nicholas II of Russia in my kid count for Alice and Louis? Why did I not include Henry and Nicholas in my count. Why are they not children of Alice and Louis? Maybe look at how they're connected to the children of Alice and Louis. Not the red shading. We haven't gotten to that yet. How were Alice and Louie connected? Why were they connected? Because, because they're the parents. They are the parents. In order to have kids back then, what do you gotta do? Da, 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 da. Oh wait, that's not the... They had, they were, <laughs> they were married, guys. They were married. Alice and Louie were married and then they had kids. So Irene and Henry, what are they? Married. Alex and Nicholas are married. 
That is why they were not considered children of Alice and Louis. First of all, they're not connected to this line here. Right? They're not connected. There's no line connecting them. And second of all, they're connected to one of the kids, which means that they were married. And then we can follow this line down and see that Irene, exactly, it's like a family tree. We can see that Irene and uh, Henry are uh, connected, and then they have children, Voldemort, or Voldemort, however you want to pronounce that, Prince Sigmund of Prussia and Henry, <laughs> all three of their children. Then, <laughs> then Alex and um, then Alex and Nicholas had five children of their own. So then if we go over to Alex and Nicholas II of Russia, we continue that same pattern of where they have uh, five kids, four girls, one boy. Yay, just like a family tree. Follow the lines to figure out who their kids are. Now, let's talk about the red in the pedigree. What, what's with red? The red, excuse me, the red indicates that sex linked trait. So we know Queen Victoria is a, a carrier. We know women are identified by circles. So Queen Victoria should have had a circle. And because she was a carrier, she will be half colored in just like that. So any female that you see just like this, such as Alice, Irene, Alex, and that's it, are all carriers of this sex link trait. So let's see how it got passed down. Queen Victoria passed this trait on to her daughter. So her daughter has one normal X and then that one wonky, the one wonky X. So she's a carrier. Then Alice and Louis got married, had kids. They had two daughters with normal X's. Then Irene has the normal and the funky X chromosome. So she had that trait passed down to her. So she is a carrier, which means that she could potentially pass the trait on to her children, which she did. Poor Voldemort and Henry over here <laughs> got that trait. So they are expressing um, hemophilia. They have hem had, I should say, because this is a long time ago, had hemophilia, which is probably why their middle brother is the one that inherited uh, Prussia, or was the prince, I don't know, Prince Sigmund of Prussia, <laughs> because the other two are likely to die pretty easily. They start bleeding uncontrollably. Um, after Irene was born, then Fred was born. Yay, they finally get a son, except the son has hemophilia because he got his mom's bad, uh, bad X chromosome with the wonky trait, the wonky gene. Then they had uh, Alex. Then they had Alex, who marries Nicholas II of Russia, has four girls without who are not carriers, they finally have a son, Alexis, finally get a son. And the son has the trait. So he also has hemophilia. How much does that bite? Unfortunate. Poor Alexis. Overrun by females and or over, <laughs> overpowered by females. And is a hemophiliac. So sad. Um, so that is how the pedigree works. Let's take a look at my husband's jacked up genes. I have a great example of a pedigree for his, his uh, side of the family. His grandfather, you know, the one that was red, green, colorblind. 
draw him. He's a square. He gets married to a lovely lady named Valda. And turns out Valda was uh, or is a carrier for a disease called Leschnein. It was named after two German doctors because, you know, who doesn't want to name a disease after themselves? And let's not go with pink. I don't like the color pink. So she's a carrier for this disease called, disease called Leschnein. Uh, Paul and Valda have three children of their own. They did not know that she was a carrier for this disease. Um, it was not known at all because it wasn't, you know, seen in the family before her. In her ancestry, we're assuming it had to have been a mutation that occurred um, within her, and that's how she became a carrier for this disease. Um, they had three children. They had a daughter, my mother-in-law. Then they had a second girl. Then they had a son, Chad. Turns out Chad is, has Leschnein disease. That's how they figured out that Valda was a carrier for the disease. Okay, so he, had, he was born with Leschnein. Um, just to give you an idea of what Leschnein is, because it's really hard to explain. Uh, this is a picture of Chad at my wedding. He is disabled, wheelchair bound. He has very, very limited movement. His neck and head kind of look normal because that's pretty much the only muscle that he can really move well. So his muscles there look just fine. <laughs> But his arms, um, he can't really move them. He gets really tense. Uh, he's pretty much stuck in that same position, um, you know, most days, all day. So he drinks a lot of water. He did double his lifespan, though. He was expected to pass around the age of 18, and he is like 47 years old now, which is an amazing feat. Um, they don't know much about the disease itself. Uh, most people that have it pass away in their teens and it's just you know completely amazing that he is he has more than doubled his lifespan but he has a lot of other illnesses associated with the disease too but this is the main the main cause of his disability so once they figured out about this disease <laughs> They went and had their daughters tested, of course, back in like the 80s. And the labs in the 80s, turns out, actually got the results mixed up. So they had originally said that the second daughter was the carrier. So they went about living life, you know, thinking that, you know, she was in the clear. She is the oldest. So she got married and had kids first. Had two kids, my husband and their daughter. But then the second daughter got married, got pregnant, and they got retested because they were having a boy and they wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to get the, um, the bad trait that they weren't, that they wouldn't pass it on to him. So they got retested. Turns out The lab in the 80s got the results mixed up. My mother-in-law is the carrier. Not her sister. So they stopped having kids after two. My husband clearly does not have it because he is a normal functioning human being. And his sister got tested two or three, I think her senior year of high school, so two or three years ago. And she is not a carrier. Um, the... He also had a daughter over here. So this is the, com well, not the complete pedigree because gotta add myself in here. And then yes, Caroline, we are, I'm pregnant. So we don't know the gender yet. So I'm not gonna put a circle or a square cause I don't wanna jinx it. Um, but there is a fourth generation coming soon. <laughs> but right now this pedigree has one generation, two generations, three generations, uh, what generation, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> what generation uh, 
does this disease appear to end in? As of right now, what generation does this disease appear to end in? Definitely the second generation, right? Definitely the second generation. Now, let's say that um, my mother-in-law had a third child. There could have been a possibility that it would have been passed on, whether it was a girl being a carrier or even a male um, having the trait. But definitely, definitely ends in the second generation. So very happy to hear that. Um, or to know that. Oh man, they cried. They cried when uh, my sister-in-law got tested and her results came back negative. Oh my gosh, everyone was so happy. They went out to eat to celebrate. <laughs> yeah. But this is another example where you can see a pedigree and a sex link trait that follows down. Um, follows it, so. I know we've talked a lot. There's a lot involved in non-Mendelian genetics, just a lot of different um, aspects of non-Mendelian genetics. But I think it's fascinating because it's different. It's not what we, you know, it's not the cookie cutter stuff. 